I'm John Banther, and this is Classical Breakdown. From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm joined by Classical WETA's Linda Carducci, and we're talking all about Mazorksky's Pictures at an Exhibition. There's a lot you may not know about the origins of this masterpiece. The surviving pictures and the artist that drew them, written details in the musical score, and of course, Maurice Ravel's famous orchestration. Okay, Linda, this episode was suggested by a listener, Kathy in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she also wrote in with her email, I grew up in the D.C. area, and my mom played the classical music radio station constantly in the background. So, of course, as I got into middle and high school, I rejected classical music as uncool. That is until I heard progressive rock band Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's adaptation of Pictures at an Exhibition, which rocks as hard as pretty much anything I was listening to at the time. That was the path that led me back to appreciating classical music. I love its strong melodies and the grandeur of the promenade and the great gates of Kiev. I also like that it's broken up into short sketches and that each movement has something distinctive to say. Well, thank you, Kathy. And what I love already, Linda, is that in the last couple of sentences, she's doing our job for us. The strong melodies, there's a grandeur, it's broken up into short sketches. There's always something distinctive to say in each movement. Yes, each one is very engaging. And even people who don't know classical music that much are familiar with some of the tunes that make up uh, the pictures at an exhibition. And she's right. I don't know if you ever heard Emerson Lake and Palmer's version. I never heard it until she wrote in. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yes, and, and if you ever have a chance, you should also listen to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's version of Aaron Copeland's Fanfare for the Common Man. Okay. Oh, that thing rocks. Okay. Well, of course, there'll be videos on the show notes page. And what I love, Linda, is that for many people, I'm sure the first time they ever heard pictures, as we often call it, was with Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Uh, for me growing up, I heard the orchestral version, and I thought that was actually the original, but that's the orchestration by Ravel because, of course, originally Mazorksky wrote it for solo piano. Yes, and the first time I ever heard pictures at an exhibition was in the piano version. My my college piano teacher played it in a recital. We had the program that accompanied it and would identify which of the pictures he was playing at that particular time along with the promenades. And I thought it was fascinating, almost a, a fantasy-like. And then when I heard Maurice Ravel had orchestrated it, of course, I sought that out because I have great admiration for Maurice Ravel as an orchestrator. Oh, yeah. And we'll talk about Ravel's orchestration in a moment because there's really no one better, I think, than Ravel in bringing a piece from piano to orchestra. So, Linda, give us a little bit... What's going on with Mazorksky? What's his brief background? He was born into a wealthy land-owning family, born just south of uh, St. Petersburg, and was a very skilled pianist. But his parents sought for him to become uh, um, something in the, in the Russian military. So he, he served in the Russian military guard, in the Imperial Guard specifically, but was always drawn toward piano and toward music. He was a member of that group we know as the Five or the Mighty Handful that centered around Mili Barakirov. That included uh, Nikolai Rimsky. Korsakov, Borodin, Cesar Kui, Belikirev, and Mazursky. And interestingly, in that group of them, they nicknamed him Humor. Okay, Humor. Was he funny in some way or just, I mean, he was, he had a very distinctive personality too. Yes, he did. He, he enjoyed uh, social, social gatherings a lot. And he also was very interested in Russian art and Russian culture and promoting that. And so in his music, he was a bit of a rebel, didn't want to follow the rules of, say, Western music. And he wanted to be more um, incorporating of Russian art and culture into his music. And it's interesting, uh, when he wrote pictures at an exhibition, he had already had great success with his opera Boris Godunov, which again is a Russian-based theme. But when he wrote pictures at an exhibition and showed it to some people, they, they were a little bit disappointed. Some, his devotees thought it was wonderful. Yes. But his colleagues thought it was a little bit of a novelty, and Mazursky was hurt by that criticism. This is around the same time that the five, this group of composers, were starting to break up, and it led to a little bit of bitterness on uh, Mazursky's part. Okay. So that's a little bit about Mazorksky. He was born in 1839. He would die in 1881. And it's towards the end of his life when he wrote this work. 
And it is a work that is memorializing a friend, a very close friend and artist, Victor Hartman, died suddenly of an aneurysm. He was 39 years old in 1873. And this, from what I understand, really shook the art world and the music world. He was a beloved character and a beloved artist and was really depicting things in a Russian, his own unique Russian style. With that, he shared a common bond with Mazursky. Each of them believed that they could advance Russian art and put Russian themes into their particular art. Mazursky very much liked the the art of Victor Hartmann, and it was a reciprocal uh, re- relationship between them because Hartmann very much enjoyed the music of Modest Mazursky and, in fact, gave Modest Mazursky two of his paintings. That's right. And those paintings would end up in an exhibition. So what actually happened was when Victor Hartman died, um, it was a sudden shock. And in the following year, the big, renowned, respected art critic in Russia, Victor Stasov, put on an exhibition, a big exhibition of the works of Hartman. And that is when Mazorksy also lent some of the those two pictures that Hartman had given him for this exposition. And that is the inspiration for this. It actually comes from an actual exhibition where Mazorksky went and he saw these different pictures. And a few weeks later, he, it's like a, he was struck by a bolt of lightning with inspiration. He just sat down and wrote the whole thing out for a piano, of course, in just, in just a couple of weeks. Yeah, three weeks. And it's interesting if we remember, too, that um, Mazorsky was a very skilled pianist. He was that before he was a composer. Yes, People find the piano version of pictures at an exhibition to be a little bit difficult to play, but he was able to sit down and compose the entire work from the keyboard, and that was the original version. Yes, it was the original version, and Mazorksky is taking us through the exhibition musically. The movements are depicting actual pictures that were on display. Sadly, half of them have since been lost, but we know about half of the pictures that have survived that Mazorksky was basing the uh, music off of. Unfortunately, this was also never played in Mazorksky's lifetime, at least publicly. Yeah, at his death in 1881, it hadn't been performed, it had not been published, but his friend, Rimsky-Korsakov, who was one of those five, uh, took the score, he polished up some loose ends or whatever, and he had it published in 1886, but that version was not really true to the original version that Mazursky wrote. So in 1931, on the 50th anniversary of Mazursky's death, the official version was published. Okay. And I'm sure we can find some performances online of that as well. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings us to, well, how do we get this orchestrated version? Ravel wasn't the first one to actually do this, right? There have been several before and after Ravel who have tried to orchestrate this. We have Leopold Stokowski, Vladimir Ashkenazi, I understand, and um, Leonard Slatkin. None of them come close to Ravel's, and Ravel's came about from a commission from Kusevitsky in 1922. Kusevitsky, the famous conductor who led the Boston Symphony Orchestra for much of the first half of the 20th century. And so that's when Ravel sat down and wrote this, wrote this all out. And he does so absolutely brilliantly. It's hard to find an example anywhere in music where someone has taken a work for the solo piano, put it into an extraordinary colorful description with the orchestra, and Linda, when I listened to it, Whether it's the orchestra version or the piano version, they both hold up tremendously. I hear everything in the piano that I hear in the orchestra and vice versa. I fully agree. Maurice Ravel was a wonderful pianist, and his piano music is just, I think, sublime. But he was a masterful orchestrator. And we shouldn't be surprised that he would take a piano score and orchestrate it, even though it was a commission, because he did that to his own works. And also, there's a funny little story here that I found. Well, I think it's funny, at least. There was another orchestration of this work. Henry Woods was this uh, well-known conductor at this time, and he made an orchestration of pictures just before Ravel, and he wasn't aware that he was working on it at the same time. But once he heard Ravel's, he tried to get all of his music back. He tried to ban the performances of his (laughs) arrangement. And he was well known, so I think there was there's two aspects here. One, he had musical integrity, and he knew Ravel's is the one. But it's also maybe a little embarrassing. Like, <laughs> oh my gosh, mine is not good. I got to take this back. <laughs> Before it was ever performed, I think it was played. Oh, was it? It was okay. played. Then he tried to get it. He tried to get performances. Um, a band or, or to get the music back. Well, good luck if you're going to try to compete with Maurice Ravel as an orchestrator. Yeah, good luck. You're going to need it. 
So we can jump into the music now. And we're going to go through these movements. And as Kathy did our job for us in the beginning, the melodies are strong. They're very descriptive. And these are kind of short, too. They're not, some of them are just maybe a minute long. Yes. And then, of course, interspersed with these even shorter promenades that link all of the paintings. That's exactly it. There's these promenades. And it's literally, it's kind of like a palate cleanser between some of the movements. Mm -hmm. Things are kind of nice and compact together where we see this picture that Mazorksi has described, and then okay, now he's now we're walking literally to the next picture in this in this exhibition. Yes, yeah, so it's a whole musical experience. Let's start with the opening, the very first promenade. It's a very very characteristic opening, especially with Ravel's orchestration, and it is well, it sets the whole thing in motion. So this is like we're walking into the exhibition, right? We're going into this hall. And what I'm hearing here, Linda, is that, yes, we're walking. It has this forward momentum to it. And, of course, Mussorgsky was absolutely devastated the year before when his close friend died suddenly without warning. But what I also hear is enormous pride that he's walking in this, and it's just this absolute display of his friend who was an incredible artist and just taking it in and seeing the legacy and he's just proud of it. Yes, there's a regal nature to it all and so he's almost saying let's let's elevate this exhibition now of these great paintings from my great friend and have this sort of as, almost as a regal majestic uh, entry. Yes. The promenades as, as you mentioned are very short and they're not complex rhythmically. They're, they're very steady, uncomplex rhythm, a nice andante tempo, which is a walking tempo. So I, I think Mazorsky really, really did a nice job with the uh, promenades because he doesn't make them so complex that they compete with the descriptions of the paintings. Right, right. And these movements have, of course, different titles, but they're also in different languages. There's Latin, there's French, there's Russian, some of them... You know, my Russian's not that great. I might just say that one in English, right? That's they're, they're kind of hard. <laughs> but the first one, Nomus, is the gnome. We don't have a picture for this one, but and we're going to be mentioning a lot here, that famous art critic we mentioned at the beginning, Viktor Stasov, he gave descriptions for a lot of the pictures that Hartman had, had made. And for there is a description that Stasov said for this one, the gnome, saying, a sketch depicting a little gnome clumsily running with crooked legs. And the opening to this, it's just, it, it is just so characteristic of something weird, otherworldly, something a little scary, but a little funny at the same time. Right, for some sort of like a legend or, or, or a fantastical uh, character, you hear a lurching uh, kind of rhythm here. He, he's lurching, he's not walking gracefully. That's right. He's lurching. And we'll play a moment here where it's very clumsy and it sounds like a huge gnome. So what I'm getting is that there is this gnome who thinks he is this massive giant. But of course, he's just kind of clumsily one foot in front of the other and then trips or, or runs quickly for a moment. I'm not saying I would hurt a gnome, Linda, but I feel like I could just push him over or give him a little, a slight little <laughs> kick, and it would just come tumbling over. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He was probably taken from from Russian uh, legend, you know, gnomes figure in so many different national legends. And from there, it's a short movement. It goes into another promenade. We're going to another place in the gallery. There, it's, it starts with horns and winds. It's a shorter, peaceful one, and it brings us to. This next movement, Il Vecchio Castello, an old castle. Il Vecchio Castello. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, portrayal of a medieval uh, castle and a troubadour 
yes. who is standing outside the castle and singing on the grounds of this grand castle um, in Italy. Mm-hmm. The main theme is played, interestingly here, by a saxophone in Ravel's orchestration. I love it because Ravel, very few people are involving the saxophone at all at this time, even mm-hmm. today. I mean, it's very rare to find. There's only a few pieces that are standard that have the saxophone. But Ravel, he knows the sounds that he wants. This could You could imagine this being in the clarinet, this troubadour, a medieval French poet who's traveling from court to court telling songs of love or, or whatever. It could be in a clarinet or some other wind instrument. But no, he needs to bring in a saxophone for that particular sound for this thing, this troubadour, which does not even exist anymore. I think that's one of the the things that stands out in Ravel's orchestration as opposed to other people's orchestration is, is the colors that he uses. He understands the timbre so well of different instruments and can incorporate them. And, and you're right, the saxophone is not being used very much around that time. Right. And so far, we already have so many different sounds of the promenade, a brass choir, the gnome running around. The promenade depicted a little bit differently. And then this old castle. And it's you do feel like you are seeing these pictures. When we get to ones that actually we do have still of the pictures, I mean, when you look at the pictures, I mean, it's so obvious. That's exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. And uh, also, Victor Hartmann would often use human figures in his paintings, architectural paintings, that is, to depict scale. So here is this troubadour. So it's not just a painting of a beautiful castle in France or Italy. It's a a troubadour standing out there so that we can get a sense of the the grandeur of this castle. And that's what I especially love about Harman in that he's he's using characters in a natural way to depict the scale, as you said. And Mussorgsky is taking that and also maybe giving a little more importance. Well, here is this person here that's giving scale, but here's what they're singing. Here's what they're thinking that accompanies this grand castle that has been depicted. Exactly. So when I heard that saxophone melody that you just played a moment ago, I was thinking of the troubadour singing that. It's a very lyrical melody. It it doesn't fit the grand castle so much. It fits a troubadour singing. Yes, maybe it's nighttime, something Mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. That brings us to another promenade. The brass are are in full. We have a thick strings. Um, We're on to the next picture, which is, what? what's our next movement here? The Tuileries. And it's a uh, depiction of children playing at the Tuileries Gardens in Paris. This is near the Louvre. It's it's beautiful. They're very simple gardens. And right from the beginning, you can hear just this buildup of uh, kids starting some kind of chase. It's a swarm of kids, I think. It is. Ravel, in orchestrating that Tuileries, gives us a very sprightly sketch, but he's uh, relying on the winds to do that. Yes, and he's he's taking advantage of each part of the orchestra in different ways, in different movements, so that all of these sketches, these movements, are very, very distinct. This chase takes us to the next movement, which is called Beadlow or also Cattle or the Ox Cart. Stasov, that critic, described this picture as a Polish cart on enormous wheels drawn by oxen. This is a little bit of a different movement, isn't it, in that this one action, an enormous ox cart or, or cart being drawn, is taken through the entire movement, right? We have this motion of it coming towards us and then leaving. Yes, it's an entire arc. Ravel was able to make us get the sense of standing right in one spot and hearing the cart and oxen coming from the distance. So it's a, it's fairly um, low. It's like a piano uh, kind of dynamic. And as it becomes closer and closer to the person, it starts in crescendo, getting a little louder and louder until it's the pinnacle of when he's reaching the person that is standing there. 
and then it begins to fade with decrescendos as the cart and the oxen then move out into the distance. And it's depicted in part by a tuba. And this is a pretty famous tuba solo. It's in a lot of auditions. It's very difficult. It's quite high. It's very, very precarious because you're also playing very soft and picking some of these notes out very high. And we'll hear just a little bit here of the beginning solo. And so we've heard that huge sound of the middle of the movement, but that's how it, it all starts. And I think the original instrument is some kind of small tenor tuba mm -hmm. that either doesn't really exist anymore. It's just it's it's something that no one plays, but it's kind of like a baritone. Today it's played on a tuba, or sometimes they will pass it off to a trombone player to play on something like a euphonium that is still able to have this kind of round sound that we just heard, but it's still kind of ponderous because it is it is a bit clumsy, right? I imagine these wheels are not perfect circles and it's just slowly coming along. Sure, the oxen pulling this, oxen are not known to run very fast anyway. Yes. So when, when you play this on the tuba then, is, is it difficult because of the breath that's needed for this? That's a good question. It's almost the opposite because we're used to taking very large breaths and expanding or, or losing that air very quickly. Here we're playing so high, you have the opposite problem where you will have too much pressure built up from too much of, too big of a breath. So if you take a huge breath and then all of a sudden you're not expelling it quickly enough, you're getting a buildup of like carbon dioxide. So you have to, there's even ways, you know, I can play, but also exhale through my nose at the same time <laughs> to get rid of air if, if you need to. Mm -hmm. But it's just picking out some of those, those high notes. I mean, it, you can play it. It's not extremely difficult or something, but it's very unusual in the orchestra. It's not something you're typically doing in any other music. I see. It certainly fits, though, this particular picture. Yes. We have another promenade, and it gets a nice little, nice little palate cleanser to take us to the next movement. This one's really fun, isn't it? The Ballet of the Unhatched Chicks. Yes, this is a nice little scattering light music with, with strings and, and the winds that depict, as you can imagine, the chicks all scattering and flurrying around. This almost brings to mind the Tuileries in a way. Exactly. And this one is the first movement where we have an actual surviving picture. And Stossoff says, Hartman's design for the decor of a picturesque scene in the ballet Trilby. These look like costumes from an actual ballet. And anyone who's had to raise chickens, I mean, that's that's what chicks sound like. They're running around and they're constantly just meeping. You hear this dull drone of meep, 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 meep in the background. And from the ballet of the chicks, we go to the next movement, which is the only movement that uses two pictures in its depiction. It's Samuel Goldenberg and Schmula. And this is described as these two pictures of two Jewish men, one rich and one poor. And the opening is so imposing. That is the Samuel motif of this rich man. It sounds very self-important, very, I don't want to say stuck up, but it's, it's, it's intimidating. Yes. As you mentioned, this particular uh, musical depiction by Mazursky is really a depiction of two separate paintings, two separate men. But he, he combines them all together uh, seamlessly in this particular uh, musical depiction. First, starting off with Samuel Goldenberg in a very imposing musical way. And it goes from that one theme directly into the next, which is the, the Shmuel theme, this poor man being depicted. Let's hear a little bit of that.
a completely different sound, a completely different timbre. And also, like the famous tuba solo in Bilo, this is a very famous standard trumpet solo that goes on and on and on. It's, um, it's, well, it takes a lot of focus and concentration and dexterity to pick out all those little notes. And when you look at the picture, I'm wondering how we're, how, what's the use of the trumpet here? What are we, what is Mazorksky and what is Ravel depicting here with the instrumentation? And it, it sounds like it is this, this poor man who is on a street corner and in the picture it looks like he's holding like a cup, maybe a tin mm-hmm. cup yeah. and it's change and he's asking passerbys for money and maybe it's the clinking of coins or something in that high trumpet sound. Yes. The first person who is depicted, Samuel Goldenberg, is depicted in lower registers in a, in a, a weighty kind of uh, self-importance uh, sound. Mm-hmm. But you're right. When, when he comes to this this poor man then, it's with the trumpet. It's it's sort of an everyman sound of this man who is on the street asking for money. Yeah. And brilliantly, he's made these two completely separate. And then as you said, he combines them. And it's this beautiful counterpoint of these two things that just work very, very well together. It's one of my favorite movements. Mm-hmm. Shows the dichotomy of those two men, different stations in life. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to another promenade, but not one we'll hear with Ravel. This one is, for one reason or another, not used in Ravel's or several other orchestrations either. Just goes straight into the market. Yes, the market at Limoges. And Stasov describes this. I love this. He says... French woman quarreling violently in the market. I'm so sad we don't have a picture for this one. <laughs> but we can imagine it in our mind, right? So so people are going to, to the market as they do every day back then, and they would go to an open market. But you have to hustle and bustle because you want to make sure that you're competing with others who are, want to buy the same thing. So these women are, are hustling and bustling. And when he says quarreling violently, it sounds more like a, a verbal argument to me, or at least I hope. But I do feel like I hear at one point... It's a sound of one woman takes a bouquet of flowers and whacks another one on the head and and petals go flying everywhere. But you get that sense of the hustle and bustle that you're describing along with these women. It's not just a fight, but it's this bigger picture overall. Yes, and this hustle and bustle, I think, is depicted very well, too, in the piano version, because first it starts off rather light, and it's a very lot of activity going on with the fingers, and then it starts getting a little bit more intense, as you say, as maybe they get into a little bit of a a verbal argument over a bouquet of flowers or some tomatoes. Oh, tomatoes, I can see that. It does sound like a very difficult one to, to play on piano. Yeah. This one, so a lot of these movements... They are compact. They have their own kind of complete resolute ending, or they do flow into the next in a a graceful way. This one flows into the next movement, Catacombs, a Roman tomb, and it's quite extraordinary, the transition here. I'll play a little bit. from a market and tomatoes and flowers, it's like this, all of a sudden, a sharp image of skulls and bones. It's almost a reminder that there are these worldly uh, disputes we have or worldly concerns we have, like shopping at the market at Limoges, but there's always those catacombs that lie there and they're they're menacing. Yes. Stasov described this one. Harpin represented himself examining the Paris catacombs by the light of a lantern. And there is a surviving picture of this one. And the movement is also in two distinct sections. But you get these huge chords, um, especially punctuated by the brass. And to me, it doesn't sound like all of a sudden I'm scared of some kind of immediate danger. It's just 
unsettling, unsettling images. Like, you know the catacombs are there. You know they're there. But it's one thing to know, it's another thing to see them. I was able to uh, take a tour of the catacombs underneath the Vatican in Rome. Really? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I shouldn't say the Vatican in Rome. The Vatican is not in Rome. It's in Vatican City. Right. But it can be a little bit scary. You don't know what you're going to uh, see. The other thing that always struck me there was how oppressive. Everything is very tight. So you walk through passageways that are very, very narrow and not much air. So it's it's a very uh, serious kind of, a, of an endeavor. Did you bring a recording of this down with you to listen to? <laughs> I should have. Yeah, nice little accompaniment to the skulls and bones. <laughs> That's right. Can I tell you something, though, that what uh, Mazursky wrote about this? And okay. It was literally written on the score. Yes. Quote, the creative spirit of the dead Hartman leads me toward these skulls. It invokes them, and the skulls begin to glow softly. Mm. Those are the words of Mazursky that he wrote on the score for this catacombs. I think this is also maybe the only movement where he actually wrote in the score as well. Yes. And we have that, I mean, it's those imposing images or unsettling rather. And there's a second section. Um, He also wrote in Latin for this, with the dead in a dead language. Yes. And it's sort of the second part of this particular musical depiction. Uh, It really has two different um, titles. As you say, one is the catacombs and one is with the dead in a dead language. That one is a bit more lyrical. It suggests a visitor who is observing the tomb. And he ingeniously brings in the promenade theme with that. Now I really feel like I'm walking around down there and it's the dead in a dead language, but something feels alive. <laughs> something feels like it's watching or it's those string. It's the way he's using the strings, um, Ravel, that gives it a whole new feeling compared to the other section of, of the catacombs where it's these large chords. Yeah, it is in more ethereal sense. Mm-hmm. And... If the catacombs weren't scary enough, and they're not scary compared to this next movement, it is called Baba Yaga, the Hut on Hen's Legs. Stossoff wrote, Hartman's drawing depicted a clock in the form of Baba Yaga's hut on Fowl's legs. Mazorksky added the witch's flight in a mortar. This is something we don't have a lot of context for in the United States culturally, but when you read about it, Baba Yaga, this witch that lives in a hut with, like, like like chicken legs as legs and it's just she takes like other forms and she chases you and it sounds so terrifying it's taken from russian legend uh, this is what hartmann drew on when he wrote this uh, russian legend there's the the witch who is the the baba yaga and she's always on the prowl as you say for prey so we can slightly make an analogy to the hansel and gretel folktale she lives in a a house that is suspended on hen's legs, as you say, and Hartmann depicts the house as a clock. There are these little cracks and crevices that you know are hidden in there, and you, you know, it's, it's scary to understand what, what is going on behind that. And now you've just made it worse for me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that's, that's scary. Here is a little bit from the middle section. So the beginning was the imposing Baba Yaga, and it's this giant chase. Now, Linda, I'm hiding, and now she's, you who, I'll find you, and I'm hiding, you know, underneath um, my desk or something. <laughs> you can hear her kind of tiptoeing around on the prowl looking mm-hmm. for something. Oh, it's, it's terrifying. And this one flows into the next movement. It's kind of the opposite of what we just heard before, right, with the the market and this running around bustle and fight going into the catacombs. Now we're going from this frightening story of this witch into this glorious final movement. Here's how that transition takes place.
It's one of the most, or it is really the most glorious part of the whole piece. So what I hear in that transition, that scurrying, Mm-hmm. is somebody running from that house that looks like a clock and it's suspended on, on hen's legs that is the home of the Baba Yaga, the evil Baba Yaga, yeah. scurrying away f- very f- quickly from that, arriving now at Kiev and the great gates that oh. open there at Kiev. And you're right, it's mighty, it's majestic. And people who don't even know the, the uh, full pictures and an exhibition are probably familiar with this melody. Oh, yeah. There's a sketch for this one. And from what I understand, for Hartman, this was one of his big achievements. Stasov wrote, Hartman's sketch was his design for city gates at Kiev in the ancient Russian massive style with a cupola shaped like a Slavonic helmet. And so it made its way into this exhibition and probably is the last thing, sort of is the, the crowning triumph. Mm-hmm. And this one has a lot of people in it, right? There is before we have one or two people in these paintings, and in here we have several, also horses as well. Yes, and here we find again Hartman uh, putting, as you say, animals and people into an architectural painting to show scale. Here he wants to show the majestic Great Gate of Kiev. And this is one where, you know, the first one I heard was Ravel's orchestration. And when you listen to it, it's so huge and sustained And then I thought, well, when you go to the piano version, it must not really hold up because the orchestra can sustain and crescendo get louder on these chords. The piano, you hit the chord and that's it. There's a decay, but it holds up. It's amazing. It does. And one of the things that I I very much appreciate about what um, Ravel did here is this uh, this momentum that he's building towards. So it's not just this um, majestic theme that mirrors the the majestic great gate of Kiev, but there's this momentum that is building and building and building, and it's there in the piano version too, but we hear it with different colors in Ravel's orchestral version. But there's this momentum that he keeps building and building, and then all of a sudden you can hear the bells starting to to chime, and that that just shows you you've reached uh, almost a Shangri-La. Yes. Here's a little bit of this building up idea. I imagine this is glorious to play on piano, but you're using all 10 fingers, I assume. <laughs> yes, you are. Big chords. I never played this, but yes, I can imagine. But when the bells start coming in, even toward the end, then it, I think the majesty is uh, enhanced a lot. It's interesting, Linda, coming from our perspective today, because when you hear this, it sounds absolutely normal. I mean, it's standard. It's part of our the repertoire we listen to. But in his time, there was not much like this. This was really out of character. I think Brahms's first symphony was premiered two years later. And you think of these, the sounds of these two composers. I mean, they are almost at polar opposites. And... Here is Mussorgsky coming up with this, pushing back against the Western tradition, embodying the Russian ideals that you mentioned before. And it's just almost out of left field. There is not much we have that's, you know, from somewhere totally different. Maybe the Symphony Fantastic by Berlioz is an example. Yes, and it is a reflection of Mussorgsky wanting to break away from the traditional Western tradition breaking away as far as structure and ideas and create, creative um, outlet in music and uh, incorporating within that the Russian sound, the Russian ideals. And so Ravel's orchestration has influenced composers and in how to use color with the orchestra, I mean, ever since this came out in 1922. And there is an absolutely incredible, really, work of art that Steinway did. They have a piano with pictures depicted on and inside the piano. It's this whole 
exhibition of Hartman depicted on the piano, all the stuff that we hear in the music. The Great Gate is on the lid, so it's this magnificent picture. And Linda, the legs, they're kind of terrifying, right? They are Baba Yaga's huts. <laughs> they're the chicken legs. The on, chicken legs. On which the hut sits. Right? Yes. That is a beautiful piano. Uh, you can get it on YouTube, I think. Yes. On the show notes page, we'll put the videos. It's a Steinway Grand, so it's very large, but it's painted white. And then all around the outside of the piano are these pictures of Victor Hartmann. But you can also uh, see there are people standing there yes. in the pictures looking at these pictures. Yes. That's what's so fun because they're also giving you scale of the pictures <laughs> like Hartman is using in his own. And of course, there's the pictures and the people within those pictures as well. Good point. Now, I want to hear it performed on that piano. And I would also suggest to our audience that not only listen to the piano version, but listen to what Emerson, Lake, and Palmer did with it. Yes, I'll put a video on the show notes page too, because when I first heard that, that was a few months ago, I was, oh, I was blown away. Yeah. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much, Linda, for all of your insight here on Mazorksky's Pictures at an Exhibition. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. For more information on this episode, visit the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. And if you have any comments or episode ideas, send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. I'm John Panther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA. 